if you have a Bible, Colossians chapter 1. We're studying in Colossians together. Good news for you. We're going to we're going to we're going to get into chapter 2. <laughs> we are, but chapter 1 here first of all in a message I'm uh, calling Mysteries Revealed. If you need a Bible, uh, ushers are there in the aisles. Just flag them down. Turn to Colossians with me. Uh, some things that I'll share with you both this week and then next week on this topic of mysteries. Do you like a good mystery? We, uh, we kind of like all grew up, you know, watching different mysteries on television. Don't know if they're as popular today as they once were. You know, we go camping as a family together every summer. We go up just north of Mammoth, and uh, not just our immediate family, but the entire extended family, like 30-some-odd of us go every year to this little campground north of Mammoth on the June Lake Loop at, at Silver Lake. And the reason we go there is because the family that I've married into, Bonnie's family, literally has pictures of Bonnie's dad like this high in the same campground with his parents. So we go back to the same place and uh, everybody camps out. You do whatever you want all day long. You sleep in, you go for hikes, you fish, uh, you go paddle boarding, you go into Mammoth. Whatever you want to do, the day is yours. You have a blast. But we all gather together and have dinner. So whatever you've done all day, make sure you're back. We have dinner together and everybody sort of contributes. And we have this big spread, 30-some-odd of us around the campfire. And then every night after dinner, Grandpa Danny tries to lure everybody into his big fifth-wheel trailer. He's trying to pull everybody in to watch an episode of Columbo. <laughs> He's like a big Columbo fan. And, and at first, like we've gone now years, and you raised our kids doing this. Uh, and, and now it's like, Grandpa Dan, really? Because we've seen like every Columbo episode like a hundred times, you know? Like there's, there's no more puzzle to it, Columbo. There's no more mystery to it. Yeah, yeah, we've seen this episode. We know exactly what's going to happen. We know who did it. And that's kind of like this topic and issue of mysteries in Scripture. It isn't so much a riddle that we've gathered around God's Word to solve. It's not a it's, it's, it's not a mystery per se that, that is, is, listen, it's something actually that's always been there. You just couldn't see it until he revealed it. So it's not like I'm up here teasing you saying, uh, do you all want to know a secret? It's not that kind of a secret or a, a mystery. It's, um, it's called a mystery, and I'm, I'm going to show you several of them in Scripture today. Uh, mysteries throughout Scripture that have been revealed. And uh, there's actually 12 of them. And, and we won't get to all of them. We won't even get to half of them today. So don't freak out. Don't worry about it. Um, and we'll pick up the rest next weekend. But the ones I'll share with you today are like uh, really monumental, huge. I mean, eternal promises that are in place, that aren't going anywhere, that you can that you can count on, that you can build your life upon, that you can take to the bank. And then next weekend, more, uh, more of uh, the mysteries revealed where prophecy is concerned, okay? Like uh, prophetic mysteries revealed for, for our specific time and season of being, uh, you know, called to live as his followers on, on, on this earth. But it's, it's called a mystery, it's called a mystery, not because it's a puzzle. It's called a mystery, not because it's a riddle. It's called a mystery, not because God's playing games with you, okay? He's not. It's not like an Easter egg hunt. It's not like the Lord saying, you're getting warmer, but I'm actually over here. He's not playing games with you. It's called a mystery because you can't figure it out humanly on your own. It can only be revealed to you by the Holy Spirit. It can only be revealed to you from above. It can't be discovered through your own investigation. It can't be discovered through your own speculation. Listen, it can only be discovered by revelation, okay? So this flies in the face of religion because religion would want to convince us that you can unravel all of these mysteries of life. 
and that you can understand them all from the ground up. That's the entire intent and pursuit of religion is to solve it all from the ground up. And it's called a mystery throughout Scripture because it only comes from the top down. Okay, this is exactly the conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus which is quite, you know, fascinating because he's like this super-duper religious dude. But he couldn't get beyond the mystery of it all. Like, 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 Like figuring out how Jesus was doing what Jesus was doing and teaching the way Jesus was teaching and he just couldn't solve the puzzle and, and, and riddle and mystery of it all. And Jesus is like, because you can't, Nicodemus. In all of your religious pursuits, this isn't something that's going to be resolved from the ground up. You need to be born from above. It only comes from the top down. And so it's a fascinating study that I hope you get excited about over the course of the next couple of weekends. And, you know, I'll do my best to sort of venture us into this issue of mystery because There's a lot of mysteries represented in the room right now. There are a lot of questions that people have about life right now. And if we could sort of like step back and see the things that God in his providence and sovereignty has so chosen to reveal, I think it would help us in those those areas that have yet to be revealed. Now I get questions on this all the time. I mean, you get a lot of mail on the aspect or issue of people having serious questions that they want answered. And like, uh, I'm like, I, I, got, I got questions too. Like, you know, like a lot of people are like, you should see my list, like the list of questions. When I finally get up there, I got a lot of questions for God to answer. Really, do you think you're gonna get to that list? <laughs> so maybe seeing um, an un- veiling or a revealing of the mysteries of life that God has chosen to make known to us would help us trust him all the more in those in those areas that have yet to be answered or mysteries that have yet to be revealed this is exactly uh, the relevance of what the church needs lest they end up losing their faith along the way and get lost on their journey or cash in their chips uh, before the ultimate outcome is arrived upon, okay? So I think the windows are a great analogy in the sense that we changed absolutely nothing where the architectural structure of this building is concerned. We just needed to break through. And there could be a breakthrough today uh, where the mysteries of life are concerned and the questions that you might have. And um, I mean, believe me, we're just a, we're, we are a, a room full right now of broken people. Amen. At least one. <laughs> Y'all need to put some gas in your amenorator. Because we're all a room full of broken people. Amen. Yes. And we have questions like, why did she cheat on me? Why did he walk out on me? Why aren't my kids walking with the Lord? Why did that door slam in my face? Why did that partner that I thought I could trust end up? Why, why? We all have in our brokenness a list, a mysterious list of issues and questions and unresolved matters. And yet, and yet look at what the Lord has chosen to reveal. Specifically here in Colossians 1, verse 26, the mystery, the mystery. The mystery which has been hidden from ages from generations, but has now been revealed. The puzzle has been solved. The riddle, 
the hidden truth has been uncovered. The, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations has now been revealed to the saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And to this end, Paul writes, I also labor. I'm devoting my life to the striving according to his working which works in me mightily. Okay, look at chapter 2. Because he hasn't ever visited this church. He's writing to a church that he's never been to. And he says, I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you. And for Laodicea. You're like, Laodicea, what does that have to do with it? Well, it's the neighboring town. It's the twin city. It's just a couple miles down the road from Colossae. And he's like, my, my heart is for, for you, for your region, for, 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 for Colossae and for Laodicea. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged that the things that you don't know and still wonder about would not take over the things that you do know. I'd be knit together in love. Hearts would be encouraged and attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge. Look at this. Look at verse 2 in chapter 2. To the knowledge to the, like the light going on. Okay, like stepping out of the, the, the mysterious unknown into the reality of, 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 of seeing. Look at this, look at this. To the knowledge, everyone say knowledge. knowledge. To the knowledge of the mystery of God. What does that mean? It means mystery no more. Puzzle solved. It means to the, to the knowledge, you're like, oh, now I see. To the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So you know what? It's worth the search. It's worth the hunt. It's worth a look to find and discover all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are hidden and found within Christ. Now, not all that is hidden has been revealed, but some things have. And we take the things that have. In fact, that's what it says in Deuteronomy. Look at this verse in Deuteronomy chapter 29. It says, the secret things belong to the Lord. There's some things that are still secret. There's some questions that you have that's, that still need answered, okay? Those secret things belong to the Lord. That, that's like a big step of faith for you and I to take together that we're not going to live by sight or lean on our own understanding, but we're going to trust. We're going to trust in Him because the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed, they belong to us. You can claim those things that have been revealed, the things that have been revealed, they belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. Okay, so um, turn with me real quick to Revelation. Revelation, the very last book of the New Testament is a book of mysteries. Would you not agree? It's like crazy book of mysteries. And look at chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10 sort of speaks to this very fact that from the dawn of time, from like Deuteronomy all the way back there in the beginning of the Old Testament to the end of the age, there is going to be confronted in our life what we're faced with is uh, mysteries. In fact, chapter 10 in the book of Revelation is entirely devoted to it. Check this out. Look at it with me. I, I, I saw still another mighty angel, Revelation 10, I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, rainbow on his head, face like the sun, feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, left foot on the land, cried out with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. Awesome. And when he cried out, look what happened. 
when he cried out, when the angel cried out, sounded like a lion roaring, seven thunders uttered their voices. I'm like, I love a good mystery. Like, what did the seven thunders utter? When the angel cried out with the roar of a lion. And, and look at verse 4. When the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write. This is John. This is John, the beloved disciple. He's like, I was about to write that I was about to write that down, and then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered. Ah, don't write them. I'm like, oh, I want it solved. I want to know what they said. Seal it up. Don't write it. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever who created heaven and all the things that are in it and the earth and all the things that are in it and the sea and all the things that are in it that they should be delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished. As he declared to his servants the prophets. So there's been mysteries since the dawn of time. There's some things that have been revealed. Some secrets that have been solved. And there's some things that God has so chosen not to reveal, and it will be that way to the end of the age. In the meantime, look at this. Look at verse 8. Revelation 10, verse 8. And then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and I said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it. And it will be in your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. And so I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and I ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. And that's the case with a lot of people that have been at church here this weekend. Many that I prayed with after the service last night. Following the 9 o'clock, it's been a busy day of prayer. And that's awesome. Because some of you come to church with that very feeling and sensation of this being a bittersweet experience. Sweet in the sense that you come rejoicing that God loves you. That Jesus Christ has paid the price for your sins. That he has conquered sin and the grave for you. That your name is written in the book of life. And you're on your way to heaven. And yet with all of the unanswered issues and questions in your life, you can come with a sensation of both the sweetness of salvation and the bitterness of still yet all that remains. What do you do with that? Well, I can tell you the answers to those issues are undiscoverable by our own reason and intellect and only revealed by God. Life, yours, mine. Like My family is not exempt from this, okay? We've got our issues. We've got our questions. We've got our challenges. Life's full of mysteries. Questions maybe today that you would love to have answers to, that you and me are called upon in this moment to accept by faith. And I think what helps that to become an easier step is by realizing the mysteries that have been revealed. I mean, the monumental, eternal promises of God that he has so chosen to reveal to us that would help keep perspective in light of the things that still remain unanswered. 
So let me give you a few examples of this. Turn back to Colossians with me. In Colossians chapter 1, we have this mystery that is revealed to us that should be ultimately for you, for your marriage, for your business, for your family, for the raising of your kids. A game changer. Big time. Every day. And it's exactly what Paul refers to here in chapter 1, verse 26, when he talks about the greatest mystery of all, which is Christ in you. The mystery of the indwelling Christ in you. You guys, that that has to be supreme in your heart and life. The supremacy of knowing that the indwelling Christ is all sufficiently dwelling within you. And that should certainly help you face whatever remains unanswered in your life. That He is with you. That He is for you. He's not against you. He'll never leave you. He'll never phone in absent. Oh, sorry, I just couldn't get to you today. That is never going to happen. You have the mystery revealed of the indwelling promise and presence of Jesus Christ. Not only that, secondly, what did we see in chapter 2? Look at chapter 2 in Colossians, chapter 2, verse 2. You have the mystery of God. To the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. What does that mean? Church, friends, not only the mystery of the indwelling Christ, but the very mystery of God is what's being referred to in Colossians 2, verse 2. What does that mean? It means that this indwelling Christ that you have invited into your life, if you so have now as his follower, if in now receiving Jesus Christ, into your life as your Lord and as your Savior, this this mystery revealed of the indwelling Christ, it goes to a whole new level in chapter 2 because the mystery of God is realizing who Christ is. That it's actually God. Almighty God who is living inside of you. And there isn't any passage in all of the Bible that helps us understand that more clearly than Colossians chapter 1. That this invisible God became visible in Christ Jesus. And for you now to invite him into your life, the indwelling presence of Jesus Christ in your life means that God is fully present and alive within you. That Jesus Christ is the full incarnate presence and power of God Almighty within you. That's like, whoa! Because some of us want to look at Jesus like he's like junior God. He's God. Fully God. And the mystery is realizing that as a result of Christ being in your life means that God is fully alive and incarnate within you. That's amazing. Because it changes our perspective in light of whatever storm we're faced with. That God is with us in the storm. God is with us in the fire. God is with us to see us through those things. In fact, uses those things to bring us closer to himself than we ever would be without those things. That's what Jeremiah means when he says, great is thy faithfulness. He is shouting that in his most difficult hour, you see. That he is with me, he is for me. He's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. This this change, this is why we're gathered together to remind each other of these things, that he is for you, that he is with you, that he is in you. He's not opposed. He's not against. He is for, and every promise in the Lord is yes and amen. You're like, yeah, but I've got this list. I know, but he's for you. But the storm, the storm, the storm, The storm is, 
Yeah, they were hating on the storm too, those disciples, right? I mean, it was the storm of all storms. And they were convinced they were going to die. Where's Jesus in the middle of the storm? He's like, <laughs> nap. Jesus napped. Be like Jesus. And they're like shaking him up, right, in the bow of the ship. Hey, we're dying out here. Don't you even care about us? And he's like, oh, what is the problem? I am with you. Amen. Right? And then he's like this. He's like, peace be still. Storm's gone. Storm's gone. The mystery of the indwelling Christ, the mystery of God, needs to be all about how you find yourself living through the moments of every single day. Thirdly, turn to Matthew 13. Look at Matthew chapter 13. Let me give you another. I, I think you'll be amazed, as I am, the number of times this topic of mystery shows up in Scripture. Let me give you another example. It's Matthew chapter 13. It's probably the most famous of all the parables that Jesus uh, that Jesus used. He uses parables so many times in his teaching. In fact, he is sort of questioned here as to why he uses them so often in his teaching. And here is the most famous of all the parables, the parable of the sower. And in Matthew chapter 13, the, the, uh, the, the sower is explained, the seed is explained, the, the, the different types of soil are explained, the, the, uh, the, the stony places are explained. They didn't have much chance on the stony place for the seed to come up, right? The sun is explained how it scorches the seed and causes the root to wither away and the thorns that choke out the life of the seed. But then there's some good soil. Finally, when you get to verse 8 in chapter 13, there's some good ground that yields a good crop of that good seed that finds some good soil and, and, and the harvest is strong. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a banner crop of some 100-fold, some 60, some 30. He who has ears let him hear. And, and, uh, and here's what I want you to see. Verse 10, the disciples came and they said, yeah, we're not getting it at all. We have no clue what you're talking about. Why do you speak to them in parables? Okay, listen, listen, listen. Modern vernacular. Why are you using riddles, man? Why are you speaking like in puzzles? Why are you cloaking the whole thing in a mystery? Why don't you just speak plainly? Why don't you just like lay it all out there? He answered, verse 11, he said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Right, okay, so here's the, here's the scriptural backup to what I told you earlier, which was what? This is not learned or gleaned from the ground up. Doesn't matter how intelligent you are, how educated you are, this isn't going to be grasped or gleaned from the ground up. It's only going to be revealed from the top down. Look what he says. Look what he says. It's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. Okay, so let me just sort of like define the has for you for a second. Because you either have or you don't have the Holy Spirit who is revealing these mysteries to you. The mystery of the very indwelling gift of Jesus Christ is because of the Holy Spirit. The very mystery of God being revealed to us is because of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is simply saying, you either have it or you don't. And if you have it, then you have been shown and given, in essence, and later would say, the keys to the kingdom. You've been given the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And he uh, will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, or do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand. Seeing you will see and not perceive, for their hearts have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes, they've closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see 
and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly, I say to you that many prophets and righteous men, like religious dudes, desired to see what you see and did not see it, and hear what you hear and did not hear it. What's the diff? What's the difference? That the mystery for them has been revealed in the indwelling presence of Christ through the Holy Spirit, through the mystery of God that is now fully incarnate, powerful within them that brings them thirdly into the mystery of the kingdom. That's exactly what he says, that the mysteries, verse 11, of the kingdom of heaven, the secret or hidden truths now revealed, the breakthrough, because of the Holy Spirit has been given to you. So it's no longer unknown, but now known. Mystery no more. Revealed. Known. The mystery of the kingdom. So you're either this morning kingdom pursuing people, knowing that your inheritance is in heaven, that your, that your citizenship is in heaven, that you are an ambassador of the king here on earth. And the mystery of the kingdom being lived out is what you live for. The mystery of the indwelling Christ, the mystery of God, the mystery of the kingdom. Let me give you a fourth one. Turn to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. Now listen, Ephesians, the book of Ephesians is filled with mystery. And uh, one that we'll get to next week, and in particular, has to do with marriage. And here Paul's giving us some of the most beautiful verses ever recorded where marriage is concerned. And then he pulls a fast one, right? He's like, oh, you think I'm talking about your earthly marriage because you've all used those verses in your weddings. He's like, but I'm actually talking about your relationship with Christ as his bride and as the groom who is Christ is about to return and sweep his bride, the church, off her feet and carry her home across the threshold. I have a wonderful friend here in town, a dear friend, who a year ago his house burned down. And, uh, and, and then uh, this weekend, after a year of, of rebuilding, posted a picture of him carrying his, his bride over the threshold of now what has become their newly constructed after the burned out. And that's a picture of what's about to happen, the mystery of what marriage represents. We'll get to that one. Before you get to the mystery of marriage that is spoken of in Ephesians, uh, you, you, get to, you get to this amazing, look at Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Okay, look at this. Which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will. Okay, now I would say that one probably takes the cake. Of any question that I'm asked by high school students, college students, singles, what is God's will for my life? What's God's will? Parents, business, what's God's will? Here, look at, look at the mystery of His will. In other words, not only is He revealing to us the mystery of Christ dwelling within us and the very fact that means that God is dwelling within us and not simply revealing to us the mystery of being kingdom people but now reveals to us his will it's not an easter egg hunt you guys it's not like God playing games with you he is not in any way saying oh I'm actually over here now I just moved over here you're warmer now you're cold the mystery of his will. Are you kidding me? Well, what is his will, Bob? Am I supposed to marry this gal or not? Am I supposed to marry this guy? I don't know. Do you love the guy? Well, I guess I could if it was God's will. See, you want it all to be. having made known to us the mystery of his will. Check this out. Look what it says in verse 9. According 
to His good pleasure. See what we're usually after when we're praying about God's will? What are we after? God, this is lining up with what I see as being really good for me, my good pleasure. Well, that's not what the will of God is. The will of God is His good pleasure, which entirely changes the questioning. Should I marry her or not? Should I marry her for His good pleasure? Should I marry him for his good pleasure? Should I go to that school for his good pleasure? Should I take that job for his good pleasure? Should I move into that house for his good pleasure? The mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself. The will of God is to use the things that are before you in your life, even things right now that remain unanswered, okay, to use those things so that He, through those things, might reveal Himself to you in even a greater way. You see, the purpose of His will is for you to know Him, to be known to be known by him so that he could fully restore the things that are missing or out of line or, or still mysterious in your life. It is his will to be known so that he can use these things to bring about full restoration to that which sin has destroyed. You see, that's exactly what he does with Moses. You know, Moses has been like running for his life. Wanted poster in the post office. Wanted for murder. He's back there now working for his father-in-law tending sheep. When all of a sudden, he sees a bush that is burning. Right? A bush that's on fire, but is not being consumed. Like, try that. Try that. Light the fire. And just see if you can kind of like keep the fire going without the wood being consumed. Not. Okay, then the bush speaks to him. This is God revealing his will to Moses because God's will is for Moses to know him. And then for all that is broken because of sin to be restored through the knowledge of that will. So he says to him, I want you to go to Egypt and I want you to set my people free. And here Moses is like, I don't even know who you are or what you're talking about. And if you're actually sending me back down there to Egypt where I'm wanted for murder, to set your people free, maybe it would at least help if I got your name. <laughs> or could at least tell Pharaoh who sent me. And God says, Here's my name, I am. I am that I am, which Steve eloquently spoke about last weekend, if you were here. And so with that, God's will is revealed. And He becomes, in the moment of every facing circumstance, he becomes exactly what Moses needed him to be. I am that I am. I am what you need me to be. Which is very different than I am what you want me to be. I am what you need me to be. I am that I am. Mystery revealed. That means if you're into flowers and, 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 and foliage, he is the lily of the valley. You're going to find him. If you're into the stars, if you're into the planets, if you're into astronomy, you're gonna, he is the bright and morning star. If you're into animals, you got your zoo pass, you're going to find him as the creator and living God. 
If you're into architecture, you're going to find him to be the builder of the universe. If you're into knowledge, you're into studying, you're going to find him to be your master teacher. You're into medicine, you're a physician, you're going to find him to be the divine healer. Hallelujah. You're trying to pass some kidney stones? Find him to be the rock of ages, you will. Hallelujah. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Let the stone roll away. I am that I am. Through all, in other words, his divine will is for him to be known by you in the circumstances in which you are faced. Here's the last one. The last one for today. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. I think this one's my favorite at least of these first five that we'll look at, and there'll be 12 altogether. 12's a pretty important number in Scripture, and for there to be 12 mysteries revealed throughout the Scriptures, that should say something to you, because there were 12 tribes, and there were 12 disciples, and there are 12 months in the calendar, and there are 12 mysteries that are revealed. We've looked at four. Here's a fifth. 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Look what he says. Verse 14. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. Now, that sounds a lot like Colossians to me. I don't know about you. He's writing to a church that he's never been to. Here he's writing to a pastor, Timothy. He's saying, oh man, I wish I could be with you. I hope to come to you shortly. But if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. In, in, which is the church of the living God. Love how he describes the church. The pillar and ground of the truth. This is the ground of the truth. And not this building. The church isn't a building. You're the church. The indwelling mystery revealed of the presence of Christ in you, which means God is in you, which means your kingdom, people, and the mystery of his will has been revealed as you have come to know him. You're the church. And you're to conduct yourself as the house of God, the church of the living God, the pillar, the ground, the unshakable foundational ground of the truth. And then he reveals, he reveals this, this amazing mystery. Look what he says in verse 16. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Great, literally in the Greek, mega, <laughs> mega, mega huge is the mystery of godliness. Okay, so what have we learned together today? Well, we've learned the mystery of the indwelling Christ, which leads us to realize that that means that God is dwelling within us and that we are part of his kingdom, not the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of our God. And he has revealed and made known to us the mystery of his will and the mystery of godliness, which can't be disputed. He's like without controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. And then he reveals it. What is it? Look what it says. God was manifest in the flesh. God was justified in the spirit seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. Hallelujah. This is the mystery of godliness. I think Paul is writing to Timothy saying, this is your creed. This is what you leave this room with and go out and live for. Go out and live for this. Not for your political party or persuasion. Not for your business or your corporate label. You go out and live for this. This creed that God was manifest in the flesh. That's Christmas in a verse, man. That's Bethlehem. God being born manifest in the flesh. But it's much more than Christmas, you guys. It's not just God manifest in the flesh of Jesus. It's God manifest in your flesh. In your flesh. Gentlemen, this is why God says, love her like Christ loved the church. Because God has now been manifest in your flesh as a husband. Manifest in the flesh. 
God living his presence out in all that I am living for and justified in the Spirit. Justified in the Spirit. That these things are not uncovered or revealed from the ground up. This is an anointing that comes from the top down. And incidentally, when you make it to heaven, some of you think in making it to heaven, you're barely going to make it. Listen, listen to me. Some of you don't know this. No one making it to heaven barely makes it to heaven. You either make it or you don't make it. You don't barely make it because it ain't up to you. It isn't like, oh, I really hope my good outweighs my bad. I'm going to barely make it. I'm just like slide across the line and just barely make it in. No. No. Not if God has been manifest in your flesh. Not if you're justified by the Spirit. You are all in. If you're making it to heaven, you're making it based on what Christ has done for you. And that means you are all in a cross, safe, glory, party begins. Hallelujah. <laughs> glory to God. You know, that's exactly what Jesus says in John chapter 3. He says that the Spirit isn't given out by measure. You either have it or you don't. It isn't like a drop for you and a few ounces for you, but a gallon for you because I really like you. It's not, it's not given out by measure. You either have it or you don't. He's either manifest in your flesh or he's not. He's either present or he's absent. You're either justified by the Spirit or you're still on the outs. Thirdly, seen by angels. You're seen by angels. When was God manifest in the flesh and justified in the spirit, seen by angels. Oh, well, that, well, that brings us back to Christmas because it's the angels that actually went and, and reported to Mary that you're going you're gonna to just give birth to this miraculous child through the Holy Spirit. It's the angels that tipped her off on, those, on that news, right? And it's the angels that showed up like singing over the shepherds in the fields. But it just wasn't at his birth that the angel showed up. It's actually, um, remember when the disciples run to the tomb, when the women come to the tomb? Who, who's waiting at the tomb to announce to them? It's the angels. How many? Two angels. One at the head. And the other one at the feet. Now, if that isn't a picture, have you ever thought of this? Of the Ark of the Covenant, on which sat on top two angels, and the mercy seat, of which now has been made available to us through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those, 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 angels, those, show, those angels showed up at his birth, at his resurrection, but please note this. They also showed up on his worst Day. Remember when he's being tempted in the wilderness and he hasn't eaten for like 40 days? And, 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 and who came and ministered to him? The angels. And it's actually the angels that are going to declare to the world his return. Seen by angels, justified in the spirit, manifest in the flesh, preached amongst the Gentiles. That's a good lot of us in here, if not the majority. But that word for Gentiles is the word dogs, preached amongst the dogs. The dogs, the unclean, the outcasts, the rejects. That's, that's powerful that he was now revealed and, and, and preached and made known amongst the Gentiles. Like, like, like um, you remember when Peter has this crazy dream to go over to Cornelius' house and celebrate Thanksgiving? It's like, go over there and fix a spread for his family, which would have been the last thought in Peter's mind. Because not only would it have been unclean for him to eat with Cornelius the Gentile, it would have been unclean for him simply to go and knock on his door. Because Cornelius was a dog. And Peter 
to Cornelius was, was clean and was, was kosher. And the mystery of it is the Lord puts them together and says, there isn't any meal like Thanksgiving that has a way of blending the meat and the dairy. So I want you to just, and add some shellfish to the whole. He's just like preached amongst the Gentiles that it is now all the, all the oxen, everybody in. Available to everybody. Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, female, and believed on in the world. Manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world. That word believed, um, not just believed. Okay, don't be giving yourself extra credit because you're studying your Bible right now. The demons know the Bible by heart. And don't be giving yourself credit because you call yourself a believer. Because even the demons believe. And what? Help me. And tremble and, 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 and shudder at his word. The word here is to rely, to trust in the midst of your list of unanswered questions. Trust. Believed on in the world and received up into glory. That's the ascension. That's, that's, that's Jesus Christ being lifted off the earth to return back to glory at the right hand of the Father. And that's the next mystery that we as a church await on the prophetic clock. That's where we'll pick it up next weekend. The mystery of what we can't wait for. And if it happens to happen before next weekend, where we like Jesus, it's actually a passive word. It means he didn't have like a jet pack on. He was like, and went back up. It's, it's actually a passive word. He, he didn't do anything except get lifted up by his father. And, and as we await for that very same thing, if it were to so happen before next weekend, then I'll do my best to explain it to you on the way up. (laughs) Unless you get left behind. Now, if you get left behind, we have a a time capsule for you at Horizon Prep. Go go dig it up. It's under the olive tree. And it will tell you how to find us. But I would pray you'd know these things that the Lord has revealed. And it would be for you and for me a lamp unto our feet in allowing us, even in light of the things that we still question and wonder, to know eternally for certain of His will and his great love and promise to be with you and never leave you even to the end of the age. Let's stand together. Lord, may we stand upon your promises. Fully trusting in your word. You might be faced today with many unanswered questions, many things that are unknown. Stack them up.
and they will pale in comparison to what he has chosen to reveal. The mystery of the indwelling Christ, the very presence of God incarnate within you, citizens of the kingdom his will revealed to be known and trusted as a God who is manifest in the flesh and justified in the spirit preached amongst the Gentiles believed on in the world received up into heaven the mystery of godliness may we declare today that the mystery of the ages has been revealed Christ in you the hope of glory and in light of all that we might still love to know what possibly could be compared with that and knowing that you are with us that you are for us that we can trust in the goodness and faithfulness of your love are you trusting in that today? Are there things in your life that are keeping you from trusting in that today? Trust him with those things. Trust those things to him, those things that are keeping you from fully resting confidently in the promises of his love. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him with your marriage. Trust him with your life. He sees tomorrow as clearly as we see this day. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him with that. In Jesus' name. If you're trusting it with it all, say amen.